Welcome to another UNCG Pedagogical Poetry Society video. I'm Kate, and in today's video, we'll be talking about odes. Odes originate in ancient Greece and used to be performed alongside musical accompaniment. Today, we understand the ode to be a lyrical poem written to praise a particular individual, object, or event. Sounds simple, right? Well, because odes have a long history, many poets have had a chance to play with the original conventions and develop their own version of the genre. Generally, we say there are three kinds of odes, Pindaric, Horatian, and Irregular. Pindaric odes are named after the poet Pindar, who enjoyed theatrical performances of his odes, which were usually about topics like Olympic athletes or feats of heroism. These poems have three sections, the strophe, antistrophe, and epode. Think of it like an introduction, body section, and conclusion. While the strophe and anastrophe have the same meter and length, usually a quatrain, epodes typically deviate with a different meter and length. Horatian odes are named for the Roman poet Horace. Unlike Pindaric odes, which were heavily produced performance pieces, these odes were meant to be enjoyed as personal and reflective experiences, and they tend to be about nature or abstract topics like grief rather than the more glamorous topics of Pindaric odes. Horace often addressed his odes to a friend, and odes that take after his model are usually an intimate interaction between speaker and reader. These odes are composed of either two or four line stanzas with a consistent rhyme scheme and meter. While Pindaric odes are more clearly divided into sections with distinct line lengths and rhyme schemes, Horatian odes are mechanically consistent from beginning to end. The regular odes are the wild card category. This is how we classify odes that have a tone and subject similar to those of the Pindaric and Horatian odes, but these odes lack a consistent rhyme scheme and structure. Sometimes these odes are called Cowlian odes after the poet Abraham Cowley. Cowley famously attempted to write in the style of the Pindaric ode, but he misunderstood Pindar's metrical structure and accidentally created the English Pindaric ode. Now, this is a very broad and Eurocentric way of categorizing odes, and it is worth noting that there are many poetic forms from other cultures that share enough things in common with European odes that we often translate them as odes. For example, Mahalakot is an old collection of seven Arabic poems that we think were compiled in the 8th century by Hamad al rayya Although these poems are more accurately classified in the Kadisha form, a poetic form that has quite a bit in common with elegies, satiric poetry, and odes, we tend to translate this collection in English to the suspended odes. There are also other named ode forms, such as the elemental odes, written first by Pablo Neruda, that often get thrown into the irregular ode category. For more examples of each of these ode forms, check out the file in the description below. Now that you've got some background on odes, let's talk teaching strategies. As with all poetic forms, odes are meant to be listened to rather than read, so any odes you teach should be one you read aloud either for or with your students. Because odes have been around for so long and gone through so many popular variations, there's no end to where you can pull examples from. If you're teaching a particular period of literary history, there's probably an ode for it. Similarly, if you're looking to teach a diverse set of authors, odes are a great choice. If you want to teach a unit or even a focused lesson on odes, just talking about the various forms odes have taken over the centuries is probably a great place to start. You can then choose one example of a Pindaric, Horatian, and regular ode to have students read and compare. If you really want to challenge students to think about form and structure, don't tell them which is which and encourage them to talk about how the examples you choose either do or do not fit the odaic form. Alternatively, if you want to focus more on the thematic potential of odes, choose odes that range in tone and topic from serious to playful and begin the conversation there. One of my favorites to pair is Donald Justice's Ode to a Dressmaker's Dummy with John Keats's Ode on a Grecian Urn. In both poems, Justice and Keats are looking at an inanimate object and projecting feelings and motivations onto what they see. Both speakers even refer to the objects in question as brides. Yet, while Keats is writing about how the urn reflects a broader truth about the nature of art and immortality, Justice's Ode is a creepy piece in which the speaker fetishizes an inanimate object and grapples with his solitude and desire for intimacy. Unlike Keats's speaker, who gets an answer to his questions from the urn itself, 
Justice Speaker is left wondering and wanting, unheard and still alone. The two odes make for very interesting conversations since students usually have strong feelings about Justice's ode that make it easier to break down what Keats is doing with his own. Once your students are comfortable with odes, there are lots of options for giving them time and freedom to explore the genre on their own. Ask them to find or even write their own examples of odes that play on the various structures, tones, and topics odes can have. Most of all, consider having your students perform odes with musical accompaniment. Now, you can talk with them about the history of odes and how musical accompaniment can alter the tone and their interpretation of the poem. I hope you found this brief overview of teaching the ode helpful. You can find a list of poems that may be useful for teaching odes linked in the description of this video. Until next time!